Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's reading comes from The Glamour of Prospecting. This book was written by Frederick Carruthers Cornell and published in 1920. Set in the early 1900s, you will hear about what life was like in Southern Africa as prospectors embarked on the land to find hidden treasure. My name is Teddy, and I aim to help people everywhere get a good night's rest. Sleep is so important, and my mission is to help you get the rest that you need. The podcast is designed to play in the background while you slowly fall asleep. Thank you to everyone who shared their words of gratitude with me during the week. Firstly, a huge thank you to two new patrons, Christine Holland and Mitchell Lease. I am honoured to have both of you become sponsors on Patreon. It is truly appreciated. It is the support from listeners like you that allows me to bring out more episodes for those who need them. Thank you to iTunes listeners for your lovely reviews during the week. Kay Callens from New Zealand. I'm glad you fall asleep quick. And EK from Great Britain. Thank you for your kind review. Thank you also to Audible listeners for your reviews. One Sandrain SF. I'm glad you fall asleep before your timer shuts off. And Sylvia Meadows, I am glad you enjoy the consistency. And thank you to Connor Kinsella for reaching out on Instagram and including me in one of your stories. As always, thank you to all Spotify listeners who answered the Q&A. Every response helps support the podcast. And of course, thank you to everyone who listens to the podcast and supports the podcast and gets benefit from the podcast. If you find the podcast beneficial, a great way to say thank you is to share the podcast with a friend and leave a review in your podcast app. Even one sentence helps out. If you would like, you can also say hello at boytosleep.com where you can support the podcast. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at boytosleep. In the meantime, lie back, relax and enjoy the readings. The Glamour of Prospecting This volume represents a series of almost continuous explorations, hardly ever paralleled in the huge areas traversed. The author is a distinguished field naturalist, one of those who accompanied Colonel Roosevelt on his famous South American expedition and his first object in his wanderings over 150,000 miles of territory was the observation of wildlife, but hardly second was that of exploration. The result is a wonderfully informative, impressive and often thrilling narrative in which savage peoples and all but unknown animals largely figure, which forms an infinitely readable book as one of rare value for geographers, naturalists and other scientific men. T. Fisher Unwin, Limited. The Glamour of Prospecting 
wanderings of a South African prospector in search of copper, gold, emeralds, and diamonds by Lieutenant Fred C. Cornell. Preface Most of this record of wanderings in wild parts of South Africa had been written and was ready for publication before the outbreak of war, and since then there has been a radical alteration in much of the country described, for with the conquest of German Southwest by General Botha, the Union Jack now floats over the huge tract of country between the Lower Orange River the 20th degree of east longitude, Portuguese Angola, and the South Atlantic. As a result also of that campaign, new railway lines have come into being, and with the linking up of the railway between Prisca, Uppington, and the captured German system at Kolkfontein, The traveller today can ride in comfort in a saloon carriage from Cape Town to the farthest extremities of the conquered territory. And, incidentally, many of the wild spots I have described have been brought within easy reach. For instance, the lonely little post at Nacob described in the closing chapters and the scene of the violation of Union territory by German troops was at the outbreak of war separated by 250 miles of difficult semi-desert country from the nearest British railway at Prisca. Today, the line runs close by where the post stood and passes within sight of the hill in British territory, the Germans then occupied. Uppington, too, with a fine bridge spanning the orange, has been brought into touch with the rest of South Africa, and with the fertile oasis of the Orange River, stretching on either hand and giving marvellous results in the growing of citrus and other fruits, cannot fail to become an important and thriving centre. There are rich mineral deposits in the vicinity, one of which, the area chap copper mine, mentioned in chapter 4, has, I believe, been reopened since the railway of Uppington, has rendered 150 miles of costly wagon transport unnecessary. And the marvellous Great Falls of the Orange River, ranking with the Victoria Falls and Niagara, amongst the world's greatest cataracts, is now within a day's journey of the railway, and with the coming of peace will undoubtedly be visited by thousands of visitors and come to its own. A railway has also been built to within easy distance of Van Rinsdorp, mentioned in Chapter 4, and it is safe to predict that these new lines will be productive of a great accession of mineral wealth to the Union, wealth that has hitherto lain untouched and unexploited, owing to its great distance from a railway. These new lines, however, much as may be expected of them, still leave untapped vast spaces of the country I have described. Notably, the mountainous Rajdeft region of northern climb Namaqualand, see chapters 7 to 8, with all its wealth of copper and other minerals, and which lies today as solitary and untrodden as when I left it. 
The Southern Kalahari, with its fine ranching possibilities and its remarkable pans, is still a huge royal game reserve, forbidden to the farmer and the prospector. And though the dry Kuruman River was the route for the flying invasion of German Southwest to the astonishment of the Germans, who believed the desert impossible by troops. The desert has long since claimed its own again, and the region is once more given over to the vast herds of Gemsbok and a few wandering bushmen. To turn to the newly acquired territory of Great Namaqualand and Damaraland, much of the latter still remains practically unexplored, and although concessions over vast tracts of country were granted to various private companies by the German administration, few attempts have been made to develop the great mineral wealth known to exist. There are exceptions, notably the rich copper deposits of Otavi and the Khan Copper Mine, both having been worked to great advantage prior to the war, whilst the remarkable diamond discoveries on the coast have added enormously to the wealth of the country. But much of the northern Demaraland, Ovum Poland, and Amberland, etc., has scarcely been scratched, And this is notably the case in the vast terra incognita of the northwestern portion, known as the Kokoa Veldt. Here but little prospecting has ever been allowed, but copper abounds, tin and gold have been found, and the former in abundance. And there are other valuable minerals, and precious stones waiting the day when the territory in question is thrown open to some individual enterprise. In conclusion, let me point out that this book, though recording faithfully some of my own prospecting trips, is in no wise intended to serve as a handbook to the would-be prospector Indeed, he should carefully avoid doing many of the things here and recorded, but should he contemplate becoming a prospector, let him at any rate not be discouraged by reading of the few discomforts and hardships I have experienced. For these, after all, were richly compensated for by the glorious freedom and adventure of the finest of outdoor lives, spent in one of the finest countries and climates of the world. And far be it from me to do anything to discourage the prospector. He is, I maintain, the true pioneer. His pick and hammer open up the wild places of the earth, usually to the benefit of those who follow him more than to his own, and in the rush for fresh scenes and pastures new, which will inevitably follow the war, he will be a factor of importance. The ideal prospector is born, not made. He may be versed in geology and mineralogy, and excel with the blowpipe, but unless he has the love of wild places in his bones, he will never fulfil his purpose. He must be an adventurer in the older and honourable sense of the word. Often, unfortunately, he fills the bill, in the more sordid sense. He should be able to ride, shoot, walk, climb and swim with the best. Indeed, if he still exists in the future, he will probably also need to fly. And the wilds must call him, 
Something hid behind the ranges. Go and look behind the ranges, as Kipling has it. That is the true spirit of the prospector. He must love his work, or he will never succeed in it. I have had men out with me who were good enough theoretically, but were quite useless to cope with the misadventures they had to encounter, and soon gave up the life for something easier. I have had others to whom the glamour of a life spent in the wilds, with the sand for a couch and the stars for a ceiling, outweighed all its little advantages. What gave me diamond fever? I don't pretend to say. Certainly I have no love for the cut and finished article, and nothing would induce me to wear it. But for the rough stone, and for the rough life entailed in searching for it, I have always had a passion. Yet the luck attending many of my ventures has been but bad, or at the best indifferent. The first tiny glittering crystal that I found at the bottom of my wooden batea in Brazil many years ago had cost me weeks of hard work and every penny I possessed. And the months of hard digging and perilous prospecting that followed that first find and that led me through the diamond fields of Diamantina and Minas Gerais, left me none the richer except in experience. But the memory of those long-ago hardships is a faint thing, compared with the glamour that still clings to that time. And even here in South Africa, the home of the diamond, not all the vicissitudes of years spent on the Vale River diggings or of prospecting in far wilder spots have taken away the fascination that, to me, lies in the most precarious of all professions. Still, the fruitless searches have been many, and I have often been called upon to make long and arduous trips where the quest of precious stones have proved nothing but a wild goose chase. A stray diamond, very possibly, dropped by an ostrich, and maybe the only one for a hundred square miles, has often led to a rush to where it was found, whilst frequently circumstantial tales of the finding of precious stones have been founded on the picking up of a beautiful but worthless quartz crystal. At no point of late years were rumours as to the finding of diamonds more rife in South Africa than in 1907, when the sands of Ludebucht in adjacent German territory were found to be full of them, and when luck led me many hundreds of miles in another direction, and spoiled my chance of being one of the first in these new and wonderful fields. Ever since the discovery of the first South African diamond in the Hopetown district in 1867, a belief has been prevalent among the thousands of diamond seekers scattered along the Vale River diggings that rich fields of a similar nature must exist far lower downstream. Yet, although the theory is logical enough, and many expeditions have from time to time searched the banks far beyond the confluence of Vale and the Orange, and a few have even reached the little-known lower reaches of the latter, and located both promising gravel and even stray diamonds. Nothing of a payable nature has so far been discovered in that direction. In the latter part of 1907, 
I was shown an extremely beautiful stone of about 20 carats that had been picked up by a transport rider some 50 miles below Prisca, and the accompanying gravel that this man brought in was so exactly a replica of the Vale River Wash that I came to terms with the finder and set about arranging a small expedition to accompany him and test the spot. Before completing my arrangements, I went into Kimberley to try and find an old digger partner of mine, who had always been particularly anxious to explore the lower Orange River, and who I thought would be just the man to accompany me. After some trouble, I found him, and before I could even broach the subject of my visit, he opened fire on me. The very man I wanted to see, he burst out. In fact, I was just writing to you. Man, I've just seen a whole lot of diamonds from a new place entirely. They're small but the chap who found them swears you can pick them up by the handful where he got them. It appears that the finder of these small stones was again a transport rider who had been working in German Southwest Africa and had brought back a small file full of these tiny stones, which he said could be had for the picking up anywhere in the sand near a certain bay he knew of. An hour later, my friend had found him again, and I saw them for myself, nearly fifty small, clean and brilliantly polished little diamonds, of good quality, astonishingly alike in size, and quite different from either mine or river stones in appearance. The man's story was circumstantial enough, and March, my former partner, was most anxious to accompany him back to German Southwest, and tried hard to induce me to join him. Now for years, rumours had been current among prospectors and diamond diggers. As to the existence of the precious gems in abundance, somewhere along the desolate, wind-swept shores of the little-known country, lying north and west of the Orange. But the region was too remote and too inhospitable to encourage expeditions in that direction, and the German regime of the country by no means added to its attractiveness. So that, tempting as the little sandstones were, I was not to be persuaded, moreover. I had committed myself to the other venture, and consoled myself with the reflection that, after all, my one big diamond from the Orange River was worth more than the whole fileful brought from German territory. And when I told my tale in turn and spoke of the big 20 carat beauty I had seen, not only did March promptly decide to come with me, but Dutoit, the discoverer of the German stones, immediately threw in his lot with us, arguing doubtless that it would be easier and quicker to fill bottles with big diamonds than with little ones. Anyway, he said, the other place can wait. We can go there afterwards if we think it worthwhile. And so it was agreed, and thereby we probably missed a fortune, for the place where Dutoit had found the diamonds is today one of the richest diamond fields in southwest Africa. Anyway, the decision once arrived at we lost no time in getting under way, and a few days later we were on our way towards the spot where the 20-carat stone had been found, 
and which we fondly hoped would prove as rich in big stones as Dutoit declared the sands of the German coast were in small. Into the details of that disastrous trip I shall not enter here. Suffice it to say that four months later, ragged, footsore, broken in health and practically penniless, we tramped back into Preska, having searched the southern bank of the river for nearly 300 miles without having found a single diamond. Gravel there was in abundance, containing all the so-called indications, jasper, chalisode, banded ironstone, in fact, all the usual accompaniments of the diamonds as they are found higher up the river, but never the diamond itself. So good had these indications been that we were eternally buoyed up by the hope that sooner or later we must strike the right place. And so we had wandered on till the fine outfit we had started with had gone piecemeal to keep us in food. And it was only when our small funds were absolutely exhausted and our tools and kit reduced to what we stood in and could carry, that we gave up on the quest of the Fata Morgana, that had led us on into the wild country, near the great falls below Kakamas, and beyond all trace of civilization. For weeks we had no news, and had not seen a newspaper, or received a letter for months. And I well remember when at long last we reached Preska, with what eagerness we hastened to that little post office for the budget we expected waiting for us. And the very first letter I opened told me what this particular wild goose chase had cost us for both it and numerous wires and newspapers of long weeks back, told of the sensational discovery of diamonds in the sands of German southwest, and the fabulous finds that the lucky first comers had made there. Newspaper reports spoke of men picking them up by the handful filling their pockets with them in an hour or two of buckets full lying in the bank. In fact, it was Sinbad's wonderful Valley of Diamonds over again, and giving due allowance for the exaggeration usual to such discoveries, there still could be no doubt that we had missed a fortune by not going there with Dutoit four months back, instead of on our own disastrous trip down the river. I had always liked Dutoit, who was one of the best Afrikanders I had ever met, but never did he show to such advantage as when he got this news. His sun-flayed face went a shade pale as he read it, but all he said was, Oh well, Better luck next time, boys. But we didn't get it. At Diar, the little party divided. March and our own tour guide of the last venture, going back to the river diggings whilst Dutoit and myself returned to Cape Town, intent on getting up to German Southwest Africa as soon as possible. And as German Southwest Africa, now a mandatory of the Union of South Africa, will figure prominently in these pages, it may be as well to give a brief account to that extensive country, which until the discovery of diamonds already alluded to, was very little known to the average man, even in Cape Colony, its next-door neighbour. As early as 1867, 
owing to reports of rich mineral deposits existing in the country then known as Great Namaqualand or Damaraland. The Cape government proposed to the imperial government the annexation of the whole of the West African coastline from the Orange River to the Portuguese Angola, but no definite action ensued. And in spite of various resolutions, the Cape government subsequently made in favour of this extension of territory. Nothing happened until 1877, when a special commission was sent to Damaraland, where they received offers of submission from the principal chiefs of the colony. The imperial government was, however, adverse to taking over the whole of this vast coastline with its then unknown hinterland, but sanctioned the hoisting of the British flag at Wolffish Bay the natural point of a huge stretch of the country, and this tiny mouthful of territory, bitten as it were out of the surrounding country, that so soon afterwards became German, has much to the annoyance of Berlin remained British ever since. At the time this annexation took place, The hinterland was well populated by various native tribes, the Damaras, also known as the Hereros, a people of Bantu descent who came from the north, and the Namaquas, a Hottentot race who had gradually spread from the south. The true indigenous of the country were probably what are known today as Berg Damaras, a little people of Bushman characteristics, small in numbers, but ethnologically of far greater interest than either of the two invading races. On the eruption of the Namaquas, these indigenous were mostly conquered and enslaved, but a few escaped to the mountains and retain their national characteristics to this day. As British responsibility was conterminous with the boundaries of her Wallfish Bay territory, these venturesome settlers had but little protection afforded them, and as German enterprise developed farther south and trading ventures were started, Germany asked the British government for its protection for these pioneers. Certain negotiations followed, and by June 1884, Germany had made up its mind to extend its own protection to its subjects in Damaraland and Great Namaqualand, and incidentally afford the cover of its sovereignty to the enormous concession of land near Angra Bequina which had been obtained by a wealthy Bremen merchant named Luderitz from certain native chiefs. This Bay of Angra Pequena, so named by the Portuguese who discovered it, is now known as Luderitz Bucht. It lies about 250 miles south of Wallfish Bay, and although vastly inferior to the latter port, also affords good anchorage. Here, Luderitz started large trading stations, and in 1884, in pursuance of Bismarck's scheme of colonial expansion, a belt of land 20 miles in width along the coast from the Orange River, northward to Portuguese territory, excluding, of course, Wallfish Bay, was placed under the protection of the German Empire. From that time, German expansion marched quickly, and in June 1885, the German dominion was extended over the whole of the vast hinterland, up to the 20th parallel of east longitude, the Gordonia border of the present day. Late in the day, 
but luckily just in time. The statesmen of Cape Colony realised that this was but a step towards driving a German barrier across South Africa from sea to sea, and as a counterstroke in 1885, Buchanan Land, lying east of the New Territory, was annexed as far north as the Malopo River, and declared under British protection up to the northern confines of the Kalahari Desert. The Germans, foiled in their design of further expansion, set about making the most they could of Damaraland, but red tape, officialism, and their harsh and overbearing methods hampered them in their attempt at colonisation. Moreover, much of the land was practically desert, and there had been a determined attempt by the socialists in Reichstag to force its abandonment. The Herero and Hottentot rebellion in 1903 dragged on for years, and cost the German much blood and treasure, for they found themselves utterly unable to cope with the extraordinary mobility of the native commandos. These excelling in guerrilla warfare harassed them incessantly, and although in vastly inferior numbers, gave the raw German troops, fresh to the country, endless trouble before they were subdued or captured. That concludes tonight's reading. I hope you've enjoyed this story, but I also hope that you're feeling a little tired. You're always welcome to listen to another episode if you're not quite tired yet. Until next time...